Okay. Uh, Courtney, Mary Lou, uh, yes. just do you have her email? She just um, emailed me. Yep. Looking to get on. Do you want to send that to her? Yep, absolutely. I didn't go to Mary Lou's this morning. I went to Panera. I'll have to uh, drink water for the rest of the show. <laughs> Peter, you're uh, you're missing out today by not having the Mary Lou's. Yeah, so I got, I'm representing today. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Were you able to get that to her? Yep. I'm going right now. All set. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is another one of our series of meeting some of our uh, leaders on the South Shore, a chance to uh, use the shutdown as an opportunity to, to get to know some of our leaders, not just talk business 101, uh, but get to know them a little bit. This morning, our guest is uh, Jim Dunphy. Uh, Jim was chairman of the board of the chamber last year and is uh, gonna be stepping up to be chairman of the board of the Y, I believe next year or in two years, he'll tell us that, uh, but brings uh, a great perspective and background. Uh, I think most people know Jim as president of the uh, South Shore Bank um, and maybe know that he came to South Shore Bank from a bank in New Hampshire. What they don't realize is that he actually is a local kid. Uh, Jim is a boomerang kid, uh, which is uh, 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 something I think uh, we've all seen with uh, uh, relatives. Uh, in this case, he's not a relative, but Jim grew up on the South Shore, went to New Hampshire, came back to the South Shore. So bring some great perspective. Jim was a great chairman of the board uh, for me. He really understood chambers of commerce understood what we're going through with uh, changing business models uh, in the economy on the South Shore. Very helpful with our strategic plan. Uh, and it was a real pleasure having him uh, as our chairman uh, last year. So Jim, I want to turn it over to you to tell us um, about your background. Uh, and I'm going to give you a multi-question assignment to work through uh, with your introduction. Uh, since you grew up here, uh, moved out of state and came back and are uh, so experienced with chambers in both states, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how the South Shore has changed from when you grew up here to what you're seeing now, how we compare to New Hampshire, and how chambers of commerce compare between New Hampshire and Massachusetts. And uh, let me turn it over to you to, to kind of give us your background uh, and try to cover a little bit of that. And then we'll get into some uh, group discussion and questions. All right, sounds good, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Um, pleasure to uh, join us on the CEO chat. And as Peter mentioned, I'll, I'll go through my background uh, relatively quickly. But I was, uh, I was born in Quincy. And when I was young, my folks moved to uh, Abington wanted something more in the suburbs, so that's where I grew up. Uh, met my wife at Bridgewater State College, and uh, we moved to uh, Quincy, back to Quincy, and that's where we lived, and we had two uh, boys. And then I started my career in public accounting, so I'm a CPA by training, uh, which back, uh, it's funny, one of the things, Peter, and I'll, I'll throw a plug out to uh, Bridgewater State, and I see Vinny's on the line, um, you know, representing the college. Uh, but when I, I graduated in 89 in the school, you know, the state schools were more considered teaching colleges and um, more of the liberal arts and uh, getting into the business studies in, in public accounting or, or an accounting degree. So it was a challenge. And uh, I went from there. I was lucky enough to go work for one of the national firms, Grant Thornton in Boston, and it worked out well. And one of the things I have noticed being back here on the South Shore from the time I spent in New Hampshire was that the college itself is uh, feeding a lot of the local firms with accountants. So I think they put it on the map. Um, I think I was the third, second or third class that graduated with an accounting degree from there. So that's um, fun to see. And so from 
So as mentioned, I did move to New Hampshire. One of the clients that I had was a bank. I never thought I'd be a banker or get into banking. It was something that never really was on my radar. Uh, but you know, public accounting, for those that know, it's a very challenging uh, lifestyle. And uh, I wasn't around my family much. So I said, well, I'll take this opportunity. And it was a big deal to move. And we moved up to Keene, New Hampshire. Some of you know my wife, Robin. And I didn't think we were going to make it because when we went up, every chance she got, she left. She missed being in the city environment. She'd walk up and down Wollaston Beach. Uh, when the weather wasn't good, walk around South Shore Plaza, like I think some people still do when you're not in a pandemic. And so I was alone most of the time. And it worked out fine because, you know, part of the reason I went up to New Hampshire is the bank I went to, Granite Bank, merged with another bank. So it was hours similar to what I was doing in public accounting, recasting multiple years of financial statements. And uh, so, but ultimately she did move up, we stayed together and, uh, and then had the opportunity to leave the Keene area to go over to Manchester, New Hampshire, where I was part of a group that did a de novo bank and uh, did that for six or seven years until it was sold. And then believe it or not, I, um, I taught high school for a while um, in a CTE program, a career and technical education, and was very big on that. And I've taught, you know, I've actually taught at some of the um, local schools up in uh, New Hampshire. And when I came back down, I did teach some classes at Bridgewater State. And uh, I really personally love uh, being part of uh, community. So community banking is great. I never thought I would do it. Generally, I'm a pretty shy person. I really don't like being in front of people. Um, so this, this is all unique for me as I jumped in and I learned how to do it. Uh, when we did the Genova Bank is we had to go on road shows to raise capital. Then I was at every chamber and uh, uh, Rotary or Alliance out, you know, you know, peddling, you know, the startup bank. So it uh, forced me to do it. And I actually, you know, hired a couple of political consultants that would help politicians learn how to do it. And then I just finally decided, hey, be who you are. You come off real. Don't come off too slick. And uh, maybe people will believe you. And that's what I try to do. Let me see, uh, Peter's long question, I'll have to make sure I should have taken notes and uh, written it down, but um, spending time in New Hampshire, a couple things. Um, it is an easier state to do business in um, than, than parts of Massachusetts. Uh, some of the rules and, and regulations that I do encounter here, whether it's some of the labor and others, um, are a challenge. Um, comparing and contrasting, there's definitely more activity here. Um, as we go through this pandemic, I think of some of the remote areas that I did business in New Hampshire, and I'll be honest, I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. Um, as much as we're going to go through a lot of pain, I think, to get through this as you completely shut down a business and some won't make it, I think the greater Boston area and the South Shore that we're in uh, will come back. I don't know how long it'll take, but all these small business and others will repopulate one way or the other. If I look at a place like New Hampshire, I don't see that happening in some of the remote areas. You know, Seacoast area will do fine in, in probably some of the bigger areas like Manchester and Nashua, but, it, but it'll be a challenge. Um, you know, so I, um, I'm somewhat glad if we're gonna go through something like this that I am in this area. Um, let me see, Peter, what were some of the other things you wanted me to hit on? So how the South Shore has changed, how our economy okay. has changed from when you were well, here. Yeah, so definitely, uh, you know, from when I left. So I left in, let's see, I left around 97. So I was married in 91, left around 97. And in fact, um, clearly the, the area is more going on. Uh, even the town I grew up, Abington, I think there was about 7,000 residents. I believe that's closer to 20. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's definitely, there's more street lights when I go, or, or stop signs and um, traffic lights, I should say. When I go visit my mom, I got to stop at more intersections than I used to um, having to go there. So I see much more activity. Obviously we all see it, you know, in the, in the traffic uh, we deal with, uh, but I like it, you know, an area, you know, I mentioned that when my wife and I were first married, we ended up, living in Quincy because it was a better place for me to commute. I was traveling all through New England um, and we ended up, you know, back in Quincy. And that was an area that always surprised me um, 
why it was somewhat left behind. It's downtown was deteriorating. And um, so I'm thrilled to see, you know, it, it building up, you know, I'm pro development uh, generally, you know, you know, aside from some of the traffic issues that you deal with, but we can, I think, you know, I'm a big proponent of new urbanism, you know, getting people um, away from the sprawl. Uh, you know, I look at that, obviously with this pandemic, that may change, you know, some of the hotspots, you know, seem to be the areas that are more dense. So this, this may change some of that thought process, which I think could be good, you know, for the South Shore as, as people de unwind or decouple out of um, cities. So I see, you know, a fairly robust um, area in the South Shore, you know, from being at the bank too. We've had, the banks had some of its best years leading up to this uh, pandemic. The last three years for the bank were the best it's had in the last 15 or 16 years. Um, and granted, there was a, a recession, you know, during that time period, but, you know, we were really able to kick it up and uh, things things were going great until we, you know, hit this. Um, from that standpoint, I think to, to see what, you know, the next chapters are, you know, we were just talking about it this morning. We had a, a, a credit, a pseudo credit meeting. And because we, you know, and as many of the banks did, we jumped in and said we could defer payments, go interest only, do whatever it takes to kick down the can, knowing that this event wasn't anyone's fault. So it's masking though true problems. You know, clearly even in good times, there's businesses that don't necessarily do well. And, you know, and this is gonna mask a little bit of that. And we've kicked the can down the road to see who's gonna come around um, and, and get out there. Overall, you know, I'm, I'm bullish on the area. I think uh, there's a lot of neat things going on. Um, you know, I, I touched upon that I've done, you know, both high school and college level, you know, instructing. So I think it's important. Um, I like the institutions we have. Um, I did, um, you know, I see Massasoit's on the line too. Uh, back when I was, uh, I think I, it's back when I was attending Bridgewater State, a couple of friends of mine were going to take uh, real estate classes. So I, I took a real estate class over there and have my broker's license. I've never used it. And um, I took, um, either one or two writing classes through Massasoit. I've never been impressed with the way I write and communicate. Um, being an accountant, you probably didn't have to do a lot of that. And fortunately now, as you move up in an organization, I can seek out the uh, English majors and others to help try and make me sound smarter when uh, written materials go out. So I, I, I work on that. But I, I think as we go forward, you know, I'd like to see, um, educational institutions. I think there's a role for all of them. You know, and I think I think Ken Quigley's still on the line, you know, with Kari, and I don't know if there's any of the others, but I think that's gonna be important. You know, one of the things as we've gone through this uh, pandemic and, uh, you know, we, you know, pumped out as many loans um, to this SBA program as we've done probably in two years. We did it in about 30, 35 days. And one of the things it did was accelerate the use of technology, like these Zoom meetings, we're using Microsoft Teams. Um, you know, I, I now have a digital signature. I never thought I'd have one of those. I, you know, I've signed things where they, you know, put it on documents that go out in mass mailing for me, but, you know, I actually have a code and was signing off on some of these loans. And 98% of what we did was all digital. So we had digital closings where people didn't even have to show up. So I believe from our institution, what this has done is accelerated the pace. You know, this was always in our plan to have, you know, imaging, digital, and we've been working on it. Everyone got, you know, call it battlefield promotions. Um, you know, when we had over hundred people in the bank working on this, learning how to do all these things. And so I think our educational institutions are gonna be important to help retrain. I'm a big proponent of workforce um, development. And I think those are some of the efforts that we're going to need to do, uh, to help keep it. And I think as Peter asked, you know, what's here in the South Shore, I think there's a lot of opportunities, um, for, for people to be retrained in, you know, retooling of the economy here. What else, Peter, did you want to go through? Chambers of Commerce, you uh, were very active in a chamber sure. up there, and you said the business climate is much friendlier up in New Hampshire, which I think almost everyone on this line would agree to. Um, 
But what's the difference between chambers? You've headed up a chamber there. You've headed a couple of chambers down here. You're very active in those types of organization. Well, uh, what, what's different in the climate between the two states and chambers? Yeah, so a couple of the chambers, you know, when I was uh, in New Hampshire, one of the things that frustrated me was uh, it felt like all we did was fundraise to keep the chamber going and didn't really accomplish the true things. And this is, I'll, I'll give Peter a plug and even, you know, some of the others like Quincy and, you know, those are the two I'm most familiar with. But as I watch Peter get involved with legislative activities and those of you that, you know, worked with me while I was chairman, one of my biggest criticisms of Peter is he does a lot of neat things, but he hides it well. And um, we, we need to promote those things. And um, a lot of the activities, even some of the clients I deal with and people I come across, talk about things, you know, whether Peter's gone to a planning board or helped with licensing. And I'm not sure the membership knows that. And so that to me is a big difference. And I don't know um, whether the folks that I had dealt with in New Hampshire, uh, because around here, you know, especially with Peter, you know, having a legislative background that goes, and it does seem that economic development in the political systems around here are much more tied than they are um, in New Hampshire. And maybe that's because some of the, the rules uh, are less in New Hampshire and you didn't need that tie-in uh, to happen, but, but I see it much more um, active. I'll also plug, you know, one of the things, and hopefully we won't lose it, you know, as we're taking a hiatus, uh, the chambers in New Hampshire were very good at some leadership development. That's one of the things, you know, I helped uh, bring down and work with Peter and uh, my good friend, Jackie Collins. I'm trying to look, this is like the Brady Bunch Zoom thing, trying to find people so you can see them. And I think uh, we have enough people that it's on two screens, but, you know, pulling the leadership program, and I was surprised that the South Shore didn't have something like that. And hopefully, you know, it'll come back as strong. You know, we get it up going quickly. And I know as Peter likes to mention that it's probably, you know, fed half a dozen people through the chamber and other organizations to uh, come through there. So I, I see, you know, that the chambers in New Hampshire were much more event planning versus actually doing work. And that would frustrate me. Um, you know, one of them we actually started bringing in when I was up in Keene, business leaders, you know, kind of like these type of sessions and take 20 minutes out of our chamber board meetings um, to talk about it. I think South Shore Chamber was already doing that to a degree by having its regular board meetings um, at different locations and getting to hear a little bit what's going on and then let the executive committee deal more with the day-to-day -day or governance activities and let um, the full board be the leadership of the community trying to help it. So those, so, so what I saw in New Hampshire was more event planning and that would be ever consuming, you know, to find the chamber business person or leader of the year. And that was the big thing and people would come out for that. But I don't know how much development actually happened. So hopefully I'm excited to see if we can continue with like the EDC effort and, and others coming through the chamber, because I do agree uh, with Peter in, in the leadership that that's probably where the future is and now will be ever needed as, as we go through. So let me give a plug to that. Uh, I do want to tell uh, Courtney, who's co-hosting this, since uh, Jim wanted to um, criticize, uh, offer his criticism of me, we have a number of past chairmen on this call, so make sure they stay muted. I don't want them to uh, chime in with their criticism uh, as well. <laughs> but let me talk about the uh, Leadership South Shore because it's a, it's a great program and it talks a lot about how chambers uh, work. This, this is a program not to train people to be better business leaders per se, but to train business professionals to be more connected to their community, uh, to understand things that are going on in the community outside of their particular industry. And it's a great eye-opener. So, uh, eight month program, one day a month, looking at different aspects of a community um, and, and how that might affect the market that they, they work in. And uh, very successful after a few years, we've had people who we've moved into uh, various leadership roles with our affiliate chambers, our own chamber board, our economic development group. But it's something Jim brought down from New Hampshire and he was just pounding me 
uh, when he came down. We, we've got a small staff. We, we go you know, far beyond our resources and what we're, we're doing with members. But he'd come down and say, this is a great program. Do you like it? Yeah. Will you do it? Uh, we'll look at it. And this went on for about a year. And he finally said, all right, I get it. Uh, you don't have the resources. If we at the bank put up the money and run it and lend a person to manage it, would you do it? Absolutely. And that's how it started. And uh, you made a three-year commitment to that. You were good for it. And you've actually uh, gone beyond that. But it's an example of uh, what makes Chambers run? It's individual members and volunteers coming in and uh, offering their expertise. Uh, and, and Jim did a great uh, job. It really advanced our uh, South Shore 2030 goal um, on leadership, which is, which is great. So, Pierre, I didn't, I didn't do it alone. So we got to give Jackie and Kathy Turney credit. They, they helped me. Um, Get it off the ground. Uh, yes, and a lot but, of people along the way have jumped in, but it, I think it was the three of us with the chamber that that did it. But you you pushed hard, and it is a great program. It, it really is one of those nice things that um, we don't talk enough about it, mainly because we have so much stuff going on, and it's about our members, uh, uh, not us. But uh, you know, we do things uh, like that, or things like. Um, a leadership in action, something which most members don't know anything about, uh, but something started by what used to be the Women's Business uh, Connection Group uh, for high school uh, young women, juniors and seniors in high school, looking for some direction. It's a one-day program which uh, Ken Quigley hosts out at Curry College every year, except this year for obvious reasons. Um, but that type of leadership in the community uh, is really important. Tell us about hobbies and interests. Uh, what do you do to relax if you're not foreclosing on somebody? Um, what, what do you do for fun? Hopefully we're not foreclosing on too many people, but sadly that may uh, come to it. So, you know, I mentioned that I ended up being in New Hampshire for a long time and I have two boys. So uh, I did a lot with them from skiing to uh, I ride a lot of things with motors, whether it's snowmobiles or ATVs. Um, I'll, give, I'll give a shout out, you know, you wouldn't expect to see me, but way up by the Canadian border in Berlin, New Hampshire, I ride wheeled things in the mud and it, you don't always look pretty. And along the way, uh, one of our clients, the bank was up there, Bolt Depot. And, you know, they sell little bolts and hard things to find. And if you're riding things in the woods, banging off of rocks and other things, bolts fall off. And it was kind of neat. So we took some pitches, you know, and where will you find South Shore Bank CEO? And you'd never expect up in uh, Berlin, New Hampshire, riding in the, in the mud. So I ski, I do that. I, I play racquetball. You know, I try to get out and do that. That's been a challenge. You know, I, um, I'm not a big fan of exercise, but no, we need to do it. So whatever we can do, that's, uh, you know, in a fun way uh, to go. And, you know, and I try to do as many things as I can uh, with my kids and, family activities with my wife so what about reading mostly uh trade material fiction historic um yeah probably more more technical um reading and you know i'll read the different um sales books on how to re-engineer um you know organizations a lot of times i end up falling asleep as i start to read so uh it, it's hard to get through things I did find it fascinating. Um, uh, Tim Cahill wrote a book on the history of Quincy, you know, and the different things with Howard Johnson's and Dunkin' Donuts. So I, uh, I did get through that, and that was uh, fascinating to see some local. I guess that was somewhat business and history tied together. How about uh, TV? Mary Lou Sandry uh, was on last week, uh, tipped us off about some new show on Netflix. I caught the preview the other day. Uh, Mary Lou, your taste in TV is horrendous. This was a uh, grotesque uh, show. I could not, I, I tend to listen to shows more than watch them, um, but uh, I couldn't understand it. Uh, this was 
it's supposed to be based down in uh, Provincetown, and, and the the TV accents were so awful, I, I couldn't hear half of it. Uh, but other than Mary Lou's shows uh, that uh, she's recommending, what what shows are you watching? What do you? I, I don't know. If it's, oh, so so you know, I'll be made fun of on some of them. Um, you know, there's some current things we watch, and you know, I think. Recently, I just finished that show, Suits, and some of those theories, you know, when you can do it. I go back to a lot of old shows. And uh, recently, I've been re-watching the Little House on the Prairie series. So you can all laugh and make fun of me on that. But uh, I go back and uh, like some of those wholesome things uh, from Eva to Beaver to My Three Sons, and it drives my wife nuts. And uh, I like those things. And then, you know, we'll get into some of the, the current things. I think... Uh, we watched the crime recently I'm trying to think what other ones. And then, uh, and then for the most part, I generally am not around that much to watch TV. I, I, I like to keep active and out doing things. So. So uh, if you're not aware of it, Eddie Haskell died yesterday. Um, I did see that. And, uh, and I forgot he was a police officer in LA too, when he left the series. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he did that, and uh, boy, I haven't seen that show in a long time. Uh, Mary Lou, I I had to endure that show that you recommended. Listening. I didn't recommend it. But, but and I never saw the T-shirt. I never saw the Mary Lou T-shirt, and I, uh, so I, I tried listening to those awful accents, and then never actually saw the the product placement with the T-shirt, but. Um, you know, it, it's very different than Leave It to Beaver. Oh, totally. No, I did not recommend that. I told you that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to back Mary Lou up on this. She didn't recommend it. But yes. she did say that you should, that, that she, you could see her in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, yeah, yeah, I think you have to watch it, not just listen to it uh, because of those accents. Jim, uh, in this pandemic a great line that uh, I th I think is has uh, almost become a trope without meaning now is we're all in this together and I'm getting a little skeptical now that we're going to be reopening it was fine for everyone to say we're in this together for a shutdown uh, but I'm afraid that as we reopen uh, there's going to be a lot less sense of community and a lot more finger pointing and trying to blame people and uh, uh, try to uh, target certain industries. The community banks have been instrumental in moving all of this federal money and the banks never asked for this, but uh, the feds used the banks as the intermediary to move this money. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned about backlash towards the banks. What did you go through at uh, uh, South Shore with loan requests? I know you had a heart to heart with some businesses that, and you said, don't, don't take the loan. Your business is gonna be in trouble as it is. This is gonna be worse. Think about um, if you can't write it out starting over, uh, but what do you think the government is going to do coming out of this with an enormous debt and some businesses won't make it? Banks going to get blamed again? Uh, what are you expecting to happen at your end of things? Geez, I, I hope not. And you talked a little bit about, you know, had me go back to my career. And, uh, you know, I was in public accounting and about the time I was leaving, but that's when um, the whole thing blew up with Arthur Anderson and, you know, the CPA profession wasn't as well liked. So then I jumped into banking and then you had President Obama talking about the fat cat bankers. And I was like, geez, I can't win. You know, wherever I go, uh, things aren't uh, working out. Um, you know, I think anytime, you know, whether it's banking, it's, you know, banking is obviously a vital part of, uh, you know, the economic system. Uh, community banks, I believe, are you know a vital part. You generally don't have many of your uh, nonprofit or little league teams or chambers without a banker on there. You know whether it's treasure or we're you know donating money back as we can. 
And so I, I do think, you know, there's going to be challenges, I think, through the SBA program. It was nice to see in the beginning that uh, we were uh, being looked at as a solution. And then, of course, it came out, you know, especially some of the larger banks, um, you know, only going after their, um, you know, wealthier clients or more affluent. You know, so one of the things we did is we did a first come, first serve. You know, if you had a full application, we processed it. Uh, we took, you know, clients and non-clients. We worked around the clock. There was a short spell where we couldn't keep up, so we did shut down taking new applications from anyone. And then once we figured it out, we opened it back up. Um, you know, obviously the rollout uh, was a challenge. You know, and you knew in your heart of hearts, you know, back in 2008 when they had different SBA program, they, they reallocated money a couple of times. You felt they'd do it this time. But this kind of first come, first serve was a, was a real challenge. And then as a smaller bank, we had to fight against, you know, the big guys figured out how to get those uh, bot systems to start automatically doing it. So there was a spell where we only could get two, two applications done an hour. Um, you know, we had 17 plus people inputting for a while at, you know, all at the same time to get it done. And, and so you are starting to see, you know, come out of the woodwork, did minorities get, you know, the right allocation, did um, certain areas. Now there's still, still money available. So I would think anyone who didn't get, you know, an amount done be there. You know, and I know you didn't want to get too much, Peter, because you've had plenty of people, you know, talking about it. You know, and I know um, Trust you know, was asking to do a good job explaining what's going on. And I will say, you know, I'll plug Rockland Trust a little bit because I think they're great um, community partners too. And uh, when I was younger, getting into the business world, that was the first annual meeting I ever went to. They held it over in Brockton, and that was pretty exciting to see. And I know, um, you know, growing up in the area, they helped a lot of businesses get started. So uh, they're, they're another asset, as I think, you know, South Shore is. So, so if you're Thank not you, going Jim. To... Thank you very much. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, but I, I do think, um, you know, as this stuff comes out, you know, you know, picking on bankers, it becomes sport or it's an easy target sometimes. And hopefully, you know, we cannot come out of it this way and that. But... But it's always hard as we go through, and there are some tough decisions you spoke about foreclosing, you know, and not being able to provide every business with the funds they need. And I try to talk to anyone I can about, you know, sometimes that's not the right answer. Throwing more debt or leverage at something that wasn't working in the first place. And that's that's a hard, you know, discussion to have, and it's hard for people to accept when their lifelong dream is no longer viable and we're trying to um you know, help them through it, but we don't want to set people up to fail either. Great. Uh, Paul Grand Prix from Massasoit had a, a message that he texted out to everybody as you were spoke, speaking about uh, leadership South Shore and what it meant for the college and uh, Gina Glickman, president of Massasoit, and a board member is also here. Can I, can I put, uh, Gina, can I put either you or Paul on the spot to talk about the leadership South Shore program and how it worked out for you? I'm going to put Paul on the spot, but um, I also want to give a shout out to Jim Spin and South Shore Banks, been an incredible supporter for the college, both, you know, when we couldn't afford to do our own student IDs and the equivalent of a $60,000 expense that we would have taken on that um, South Shore partnered with us on and the um, leadership uh, where we hosted it at, Can in, at our Canton campus, and it resulted in some gifts that um, I had talked about once at a board meeting. I'm going to let Paul talk about it because he was very involved in that um, engagement, and I know there he is. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Good morning. Thanks, Tina. Yes, um, we met uh, Gavin Williams through Leadership South Shore. It was on the, uh, uh, the Canton campus. He got a tour. He smelled it fuel coming from our uh, diesel tech laboratory and they ended up donating two very old used fuel delivery trucks to our program to use in the diesel lab and worked out an arrangement with our uh, program to do the annual maintenance on his trucks at the end of the season as a educational tool for our diesel tech students. It was an in incredible connection. We've also met other folks um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on some other of the folks, uh, Liberty Mutual, uh, 
uh, we've made a, a connection with Liberty Mutual and on and on. Several of our employees have benefited from the leadership development program. So Jim, your leadership and uh, advocacy for that program. I still wear my leadership South Shore hat around uh, whenever I'm out as well. The ripple effect of, the, of our relationships and networking is incredible. I mean, to the value to the college of not having to buy a, a new truck for the diesel program, for the, the um, partnership with the student ID and getting students to understand banking issues, and we've got, um, they participate in our orientation. It's a value, a dollar value of over a hundred thousand dollars. But even besides the um, what the money that it saved the college is that the ripple effect with our students and the building sense of community um, is just amazing. And and it's gonna, you know, it'll extend on for years those kinds of relationships. So Jim, thank you so much, and thank you also for sharing this, your story and some of the stories of, of the people that you've been engaged with and your engagement with community colleges over a very long period of time. So we are very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. He hates being called out on this. I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fun to do it. <laughs> you never think your story's all that interesting, so. <laughs> yeah, and you never know who it affects. That's the other piece is that your personal stories, and this is, um, Peter, thank you for doing this, is you never know whose life you touch that touches another life that touches another life. So um, it's, you know, one act of kindness, one act of thoughtfulness, and it goes, it's just, it's what, it's how we build community. So thank you. Gina, while I've got you and I can see the picture uh, that does not look like a virtual backdrop, what are all the books? What are you reading now? Are those all uh, 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 books on education? Uh, so this is a virtual backdrop, or I would I have really? my back to the door of the bathroom in my studies. Oh, so okay. It, it is a virtual backdrop, although if I was allowed to be in the um, other room, which is where my husband has his computer, there is a set of bookcases that look just like that, but not with a ladder. Um, but I'm glad it doesn't look like that. I, um, right now, I'm turning around and I'm gonna show you that I am reading. Of course you can't, this is re reflected. So um, Jim, budgets and financial management in higher education. <laughs> That sounds exciting. <laughs> that sounds so exciting. Um, it's not as much fun as the book Operator that I'm reading, but, uh, that's sitting on my bedside, or um, a, a bunch of other books that I have here that are fun. Alexander McCall Smith, one of my favorites, um, that takes place in South Africa. But I have just signed on to teach a resource management course <laughs> at Johnson & Wales in the fall. And I was told that the last person who taught it and the curriculum is completely outdated. And so, um, so I don't have a business finance background, but I've been in higher ed for 40 years. So I deal with it every day. Um, and they decided they didn't need someone like a Bill Mitchell who works with me, who does oversee our finance area, but someone who as a leader um, uses the principles and, uh, so, so anyway, this is, uh, this is the beginning of my um, sort of putting it into some kind of format for, for rising higher education leaders. <laughs> that is a really boring book. I think I'd rather watch Mary Lou's TV show. I, <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry that it wasn't more exciting, but, um, but the book Operator I've been reading and, and I have lately because I've, um, don't have a lot of time to read because I've also teach and this. So I have downloaded Kindle books on, and I'm embarrassed to say that most of them are mysteries that take, well, you know, actually they're sort of fun. Kara Black is a great mystery writer. They, um, so lots of local mysteries that take place in um, foreign countries. So Donna Leone, if anybody reads Donna Leone, they take place in Venice. Uh, Kara Black, um, France. Um, so yeah, so that's my really, that's my escapism since we can't really travel. <laughs> I, found, I found mystery authors who, um, who write in different locales. So there, that's a lot more fascinating, Peter.
So when Ken Quigley was my uh, chair, I got called to the principal's office many times. So I know that the bookcase behind him is his real office. I, uh, he Ken, was, what, uh, what do you have to do? Unlike you, me, no, I haven't read the books, Peter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, they, but they look good. So, you know, Peter, you know, can I... <laughs> Peter, let me just talk about another partnership because now that Ken's on the line, um, because of our relationship on the South Shore Chamber, um, which is I think where I first met Ken, although he probably just called me and said, welcome to Massachusetts, what can we do together? Um, we actually started the first baccalaureate completion program located on our campus in nursing, and we're working on two more that'll start in the, well, on campus, a sort of joke, right? Um, uh, which ones are they, Ken? The criminal justice? What's there now, Gina, is the uh, BS in nursing. Yes. We're laddering up on the associate's degrees that Massasoit does a terrific job in delivering. And through Gina's leadership and vision, actually, uh, we are now uh, actually teaching with Curry employees baccalaureate uh, degrees in nursing on the Massasoit campus. It's been a great mm -hmm been a great partnership and we're expanding it to uh, business management and criminal justice. And that should come out in the fall and this is part of we have a new website up now called the University Collaborative so students who are our students or any students who um, and the first class without even advertising nursing we had 25 students register that's how um, significant that was so we're really delighted to have that partnership so thank you Ken. And we're grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. All right. So what's on people's minds? We've got about uh, 10 minutes. I'm curious. The governor made his announcement yesterday on the uh, phased in uh, reopening. Uh, we have a call today. Business uh, community chambers have a call with the Secretary of Economic Development this afternoon. Uh, on Thursdays for the next five or six weeks from 2 to 3 o'clock, we're having an open, uh, essentially a town meeting forum for businesses, members or not, uh, to call in, uh, hear from some uh, experts in different fields like employment law um, or finance or whatever to, to talk about uh, what our members or small businesses are going to go through uh, with reopening. But the announcement was made uh, yesterday. I've got a call in a few hours with the secretary. Uh, I'd love to hear, if you don't have a question for, for Jim, I'd love to hear what any of you think about uh, the governor's announcement yesterday. And you just have to unmute yourself uh, to do that. No comments. Everyone was happy with the governor's announcement. So I'll, I'll make it, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up that mantle. Um, you'll know that you noticed in his announcement that he didn't mention higher education. <laughs> but in the report itself, we are listed um, for phase one, which allows us at this point, as long as there is a plan in place, to have some on-site um, programs for, and support services for students related to things like our allied health programs. So our phlebotomists can come in and get hands-on training. Um, our, and, in, and I think it's uh, sometime in June, after May 25th, we have to have a uh, plan in place. So we are working on our, um, what they're calling a repopulation plan. Um, and at, across the entire segment of higher, across higher education in the, in the Commonwealth, but also by segment. Each college may be a little different, um, and that's allowable. So the initial plan is to slowly um, bring students back who need the hands-on experience, either in a clinical setting or a lab setting, um, in, and then also um, bordering phase one, phase two, the technology programs will be able to have a hands-on component. So students who have taken an incomplete in order, in order to move forward, um, we'll be able to allow for that as long as we have uh, PPE available and we have the sanitization that we can do. Um, 
It's very difficult for higher education to do that because, you know, we have to be able to take temperatures, we have to be able to do contact tracing. So there are some, so we're going to be doing it very, very slowly. Although for us, we are primarily going to be online um, and remote over the summer. We haven't yet made an announcement about fall, but I just wanted to note that the governor's didn't speak directly to it, but higher education is included um, in his phase one plans. Peter, I have a question for Jim, if that's okay. Uh, sure, I'm not seeing the screen. Who's speaking here? Uh, Vinny, v Senator DiMacito, how are you? Was, and it'll be over today, by the way. Um, okay. hey, Jim, uh, great to see you. Uh, just curious, obviously, you've kind of seen things starting to move again in the economy. You know the South Shore really well. Uh, looking out a year from now, it, what do you sense as far as what the economy is going to look like in southeastern Massachusetts? Uh, you know, what are your, your sense? It seems, at least I'm a business owner as well, that I was initially down 40 percent, now 20 percent. Things are starting to move again. Do you think I know it'll never be like it was, but do you think that because this was a forced um, shutdown that the economy will come back? I, I, I mean, I don't know when it'll come back fully, you know, so I don't know if it's a year, two years, three years. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, I, I'm very bullish on this area in the long run. I think it all depends on how, how we reopen up because, you know, you know, some of the things we look at in our clients is, you know, ability to withstand events like this and you, you hopefully don't have too many of these events in your career or you know in a business every day that you know business stays down um you know it's harder to come back from but you know capital and facilities will, will be out there so you know a restaurant that doesn't make it someone may come in and backfill it so i do think you know we'll, we'll come back in relatively quickly probably compared to the overall country you know and then the concern is do we open up and then do we have other waves of this that scares people you know and, and hopefully we don't have to shut down again um so you know and fear fear is a big part of this too and will people come out and feel good about it some people are going to come out and not care about it at all others aren't so um you know we're we're waiting in in to see what, what will happen, but there's so many, it's not like a traditional recession where you can predict, even though the last time it was a housing crisis, you know, we overlent in that. Once you work to that inventory, got people back working, um, you know, nothing matters until you get everyone back working. And, you know, the folks in education, not as much higher education, but until daycare centers and schools can truly reopen, how do most working families get back to? So, so those are some of the concerns I have. I think once we can get through this, um, things will start coming back well. I just don't know when that day is. Well, thank you. And I appreciate the shout out to BSU as well as, <laughs> as one of our proud uh, alumni. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, can you uh, hear me? Jack. Jack. Jack, can you get closer to a, a microphone? Can you hear me now? Little no, bit. You're going to have to show. All right. Um, can you hear me now? Little better. Go ahead. All right. So, um, as some of you may know, in addition to my uh, investment uh, practice, I also am a selectman in Tallahassee. What I'm hearing increasingly is um, many of the people who are members of the chamber, they're hurting. The financial burden upon small business absolutely huge and I think we're getting to the point where many of them are afraid that their business is no longer sustainable and I'm hearing a lot of people privately tell me that um, they want to move forward with getting it open because if it doesn't happen fairly soon they won't be around yeah we're we're hearing uh, I just did a, a radio uh, interview before uh, this event this morning, but uh, we are beginning to hear from uh, retailers. When I looked at the list, my reaction was good to have some fixed dates. Uh, that that gives some hope, and good to have safety measures in place. That that seemed to be the most important thing for each industry. 
but there's a lot of spread within these industries. Uh, and you wonder why a retailer that often has less congestion in their place has to wait till mid June when other operations like churches are going to be more crowded uh, one day a week uh, and they're able to, uh, to open. But um, even though it's, it's good to have some dates, we are uh, concerned with businesses that are often on thin margins like retailers having to wait even the extra uh, couple of weeks and we'll be raising that uh, with the secretary. Jack, I'll tell you the other concern that I have is while it was good to have some dates and a phased plan and good to have safety guidelines, I'm concerned about how much of this plan now gets thrown on to local officials and particularly boards of health or police departments because uh, citizens who may have their own view about what is safe uh, may go buy stores and say, you know, I think I saw too many people in that store window uh, as I walked by. I'm going to call my board of health. And I don't know how towns are going to have health agents or police chiefs who are going to be able to come in and start dealing with an employee who's too nervous about, uh, uh, you know, were the signs posted in the right place? Are there tape measures, distancing people? Or, you know, somebody who doesn't even go in the shop but has taken it on as a citizen crusader. I don't know how you're going to deal with this as a town official. Neither do I. We do hear a lot about that. Um, I do hear some resentment. And I think the point is people have been cooped up for so long that we are seeing heightened I think, by and large, our um, police have done a very good job. They've been very responsive. Um, and people have, I think, the unsung heroes of this is the, is the average citizen. The average citizen has been very patient. But I think you know, from a public uh, official perspective, um, we need now to, our citizens have been very patient. But I do think that it's time for us to move forward measured way because you know the um, we got to turn down the heat on the compression Gina you have been saved from uh uh probably the worst book of the morning Paula Harris is telling us she's reading what's the deal with social security for women this is not uh uh late night reading I suspect Paula what is that, and you have a webinar on it coming up. Uh, believe it or not, there are strategies to understanding Social Security, and it's best to know them before you retire. So this is really geared for people in their 50s and early 60s, and we're doing a webinar at 7 o'clock at night on Wednesday the 27th, um, and everyone who attends, you can have your own copy of Marsha's book. Marsha's an author um, and a retirement um, a uh, speaker based in Hanover and uh, Plymouth. So uh, if anyone's interested, you can check out the website. But Peter, you caught me because I had reduced the size of our, my screen so I could go and look at that website. And Paula, I couldn't figure out where on the website you registered. <laughs> well, on to the, um, it should be on the home page. We're actually, the website's changing. It could be today or tomorrow, but it should be on the home page. You could find um, a blog post that is up in the blog. I'll, I'll do a better link. It, you know, there, it's very interesting. And one of the things, especially for women that maybe didn't stay in the workforce very long, they could be just a few quarters away, and this could be some men too, a few quarters away from being eligible for Social Security. And you don't want to find that out when you're 66, that you need to go back to work for a year in order to get your Social Security. So it's better to be educated sooner versus later. I think the, com the difficulty also is in trying to determine whether or not if your spouse takes it, if you can take it as a spousal benefit, when you take it as a spousal benefit, do you take it then so that you don't screw up your own sp benefit? Um, those, are, those are questions that are really, they're, they're very gracious in Social Security, but they can't give you advice. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of it is the question, you need to know the questions to ask. 
Right. Um, right. And the best advice is to wait until you're 70. Do not take it um, right when you're eligible. You want to wait to your full retirement age, if not 70. It is the best deal right now. Uh, Social Security uh, tables have not changed, and you can get a guaranteed 7 or 8% increase every year, which the stock market can't guarantee that. So waiting till 70 should be in everybody's mind. Excellent. Hey, Peter. Yes, Tim. Um, I had a question for Jim related to housing. Typically, that's the thing that gets us out of recessions. Um, and in the South Shore, we're very low on inventory. It's a very hot market for a seller right now. And I've heard from people that mortgage rates are going to be low coming out of this. I uh, just wanted your perspective on it and how important uh, the housing is going to be in this South Shore area. I, I agree with what you said. Uh, I do believe rates will probably stay low for the foreseeable future. Um, I do like to say if I could truly predict that, I probably wouldn't be on this call with you. <laughs> I would have uh, hedged interest rates somewhere else. But, uh, you know, with, with the amount of, of debt out there in all categories, whether it's federal, state, pension, you know, uh, retirement funds that are underfunded, that any large jump up in rates only will leave us in some sort of a recessionary period. Um, and we do hear that, you know, um, we, you know, had some challenges on the residential side and uh, getting appraisers to come out to properties, people to let them in. So there's been some logistics that are being worked through, uh, but there still does seem to be activity uh, with a low inventory and, uh, you know, so you're hearing pockets of that and our residential pipeline is probably on average considering all things that are out there. So um, then the key is, you know, you still need some of that new inventory to go up to. And so hopefully as the construction trades get back going and they figure out how to do this in a socially distant way, we can have some of those projects uh, come to the market. Great. All right. We're coming up on the hour. Uh, Jim, thank you uh, very much. Thursday, uh, we're doing a uh, slightly different format. We're going to have a discussion looking at the cultural economy uh, and the arts with Kathy Cherney from South Shore Conservatory and Zoe Bradford from the company Theater in Norwell. Uh, taking a look at what this has meant for them and talking about um, the, the cultural economy on the South Shore. Next Tuesday, uh, Catherine Hesse, uh, partner of Murphy Hesse, Toomey and Lahane, and an expert on employment law, and uh, also a past chair of the chamber. Uh, and then uh, we're lining up uh, next Thursday. I'm waiting to hear from uh, somebody, so check the website. Uh, on that. And then Thursday afternoons from two to three, as I mentioned, uh, something will be running for the next five weeks uh, starting this Thursday. And it is going to be an open member discussion trying to help our members uh, answer some of the questions about reopening and uh, deal with their issues. We're finding that while there are government advisories on their policies. Really what uh, our business owners and members need is to be able to talk through their own specific situation and talk to some peers uh, to figure out some common sense approaches as to how they, they do this. So uh, that's up on the website. You can uh, sign up. Jim, you're a great chairman last year. I appreciate it. You're doing great work for the, the community and the chamber uh, and our members. Thanks for doing this uh, this morning. I'll, I'll turn over the last word to you and you can sign us out. Sure. My pleasure. Thank you all. I appreciate you uh, getting together and uh, let's all keep working on ways to keep the South Shore vibrant. And uh, I look forward to when we're through this. Thank you. Thanks.